I was facilitating this whole session, but someone had to come in and give a presentation. And the executive team actually had, was all men. There was one woman in the room who wasn't officially one of the executives, but reports to one of the executives and he wasn't there. So she was sort of there in his place. And the person who came in to present was also was female. She gave her presentation about something they were doing marketing wise, whatever, and then people left. And after the, we were debriefing, I said, before we go back into what we we're talking about, I just want to ask you all, how do you think she felt presenting to all of you just now? What do you think when she goes home to talk to the people at home or goes back to talk to her team? What do you think she's going to say about how that went? And they weren't like really nasty. They just they weren't really paying attention to her is what was going on. And I said, do you think she told her spouse this morning that she was going to meet with the executive team? Do you think the people on her team knew she put that deck together and came? Do you think that was a big deal for her? And then I asked. And then again, it was like I, I asked. I said, and also, look, and we're busy. Oh, yeah, we could get better. And I said, and do you think you would have treated her the same way if she were a man? Everyone has a diversity story, even those you don't expect. Welcome to The Will to Change with Jennifer Brown. Get ready to hear from leading CEOs, best-selling authors, and entrepreneurs as we uncover their true stories of diversity and inclusion. And now here's your host, Jennifer Brown. Welcome to The Will to Change. This is Jennifer Brown. Our guest today is Mike Robbins. Mike is the author of four books with a fifth on the way and delivers keynotes about personal and team empowerment across a broad spectrum of corporate clients, including Google, Wells Fargo, eBay, Gap, and Microsoft. Prior to his current work, Mike played baseball at Stanford and then professionally with the Kansas City Royals. After his athletic career was cut short by injuries, he worked in the tech world before starting his consulting business in 2001. Mike and his work have been featured on ABC News, the Oprah Radio Network, and in Forbes. He's a regular contributor to Medium, and his books have been translated into 15 different languages. I knew I had to meet Mike when I saw the title of his book, of course, Bring Your Whole Self to Work. I have to admit, I was intrigued by this straight white man writing such a book. We then shared the stage at the Better Man Conference in San Francisco last fall, and I discovered even more connections with Mike. One of his favorite exercises to lead from the keynote stage is to complete this sentence. If you knew me, you'd know. And he does this three times. If you really knew me, and then if you really, really knew me. Peeling the onion of his own diversity story, getting more and more vulnerable each time. He then asks the audience to do the same. In today's conversation, Mike shares some of those stories with us. As a kid of a single mom, raised in a feminist household, the only white kid in school before his college years, and then an aspiring athlete who faced injury and had to change course dramatically. He and I share a deep interest in what's below the waterline for all of us, the need we have to connect and truly see each other. And we've each witnessed the transformative impact of this conversation in these large rooms where we spend so much of our time speaking and presenting. I think Mike would agree, it is exhilarating work. Mike, welcome to The Will to Change. Thanks, Jennifer, glad to be here. I'm glad to to know you. It's funny, you came to me because we talk about this same concept and the title of your last book, which is Bring Your Whole Self to Work. <laughs> and I thought to myself, who is this person? <laughs> um, and it turns out we're sort of existing in parallel speaker, keynoter, author lives, um, yeah. but but from very different worlds and backgrounds. And um, yeah. it's such cool synergy when you discover that. So um uh, we always start the will to change with our diversity stories, and I know a bit about yours, and it is rather fascinating um, yeah. and unexpected in some ways. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you consider that to be? Well, thank you. I, I appreciate being asked that, particularly in that context. I So I grew up in Oakland, California, right outside of San Francisco. I still live in the Bay Area, and uh, my parents, uh, my dad was Jewish, and my mom Catholic and both grew up on the East Coast, but met in San Francisco. They actually split up when I was three. Um, and, you know, I grew up going to city schools, inner city schools in Oakland. And definitely by the time I was, you know, in late elementary school and into junior high school and high school was very aware of the fact that I was one of the few white kids in the school, particularly playing sports. I played basketball and I played baseball 
And my in high school, I went to Skyline High School in Oakland, California. And not only was I the only white kid on the basketball team, I was the only white kid in the whole league. Um, so, you know, my awareness of my whiteness and my race was pretty significant, as well as even, you know, my religious background. Neither of my parents were very religious, but I understood that my dad being Jewish and my mom being Catholic was kind of not so much unique, but just different. And I grew up actually going to a Lutheran church. So the whole religious thing was kind of confusing Hmm. for me. But I also had an older sister, Lori, who I grew up with in my house. And my mother never remarried, so I was raised by a single mom who was a very strong feminist and uh, took me out of school when I was 10 years old when Geraldine Ferraro was running for vice president. She came through Oakland to speak in front of City Hall and um, you know, women like Gloria Steinem and uh, Billie Jean King and Susan B. Anthony were talked about in my house as heroes in a very significant mm-hmm. way. So then I get drafted out of high school, actually, by the New York Yankees because I was pretty good at baseball. That was my primary sport. Um, and I went to I didn't sign with the Yankees because I went to Stanford to play baseball. And I get to Stanford and all of a sudden um, my diversity world was very different. I had never been around that many white people in my life. And my Stanford baseball team, which a lot of those guys are still really good friends of mine, literally, <laughs> literally felt like the young Republicans club. And I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> what is this? I don't even know where I fit. Um, so it was interesting. And I learned a lot and, and you know, became very aware of my yeah you know, being white and being male and what that meant in the world, very different than the house I grew up in, in the city I grew up in, in the schools that I went to as a kid. So it was kind of an interesting journey. And I actually got my degree at Stanford in American studies with a specialization in race and ethnicity. Um, And just to kind of complete it, I mean, there's more to my story and my diversity story, but I ended up getting drafted by the Kansas City Royals out of Stanford. And I signed a pro contract, went into the minor leagues as you do in baseball. And I unfortunately got injured. I was a pitcher and I hurt my arm. Um, when I was still in the minor leagues, I was 23 and then three surgeries and two years later by the age of 25, um, like you, although not, you know, you were in the arts and I was in sports. Mm -hmm. I had to, um, move on from my life, you know, 18 to the first 25 years of my life playing baseball. And after my injuries and surgeries, I wasn't able to come back. So I had to move back home to, uh, the Bay area and figure out, what was next for me and what I was going to do after baseball. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And naturally, (laughs) naturally you became a, a multi uh, book author, right? I think this year on your fourth book. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. Bring your whole self to work was number four and I'm Mm -hmm. just uh, flirting with the idea of number Mm -hmm. five at the moment. But yeah, I mean, so when I, when I got home, you know, I'm, I'm 44, almost 45 now. So this was 20 years ago. Um, I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. I ended up getting a job. It was the late 90s. I got a job in sales working for a tech company. I was just trying to figure myself out and was going through quite a process, as I imagine you did as well, to who am I if I'm not an athlete, Um, and started to get really involved in, you know, I was seeing a therapist and was going through my own process, but got really involved in taking lots of workshops and reading lots of books that were about, uh, you know, sort of life and purpose and, and also just dealing with some of my own pain and my own shame and my own confusion about who I was as a human being and got so interested in that work for myself personally, I started to have this fantasy and it really was a fantasy at the time that like, I want to be a part of this world. I want to like write and, and speak and help people along their journeys in life, whatever that might look like. But I had no idea how one started to do that or became sort of qualified or credentialed to do that, if you will. I always kind of thought maybe if I made it to the major leagues and became a sort of famous baseball player, people might be interested in some of my theories on life right. and success because I was well known, <laughs> but not being well known, I thought, who the heck's going to listen to me? <laughs> <laughs> but but just a couple years of, you know, a couple tech companies and then I got laid off and I had a mentor of mine really challenge me and say, if you could do anything, you didn't have to worry about paying the rent and you know everything were handled, what would you do? And I said, well, I would write and I would speak and I would try to teach and inspire people. And he was like, okay, great, you should do that. And I was like, now? I'm like, I'm just barely, you know, almost 27 years old. And like, <laughs> do I don't I know anything. Say? And I don't, yeah, who's going to listen to me? And so, but I just started coaching and I started speaking and, and ultimately started writing. And um, it was it wasn't easy at first. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I got a lot of good mentorship and a lot of support and some luck. And, you know, and look, and looking back as we're going to talk more about race and gender and diversity, I mean, being straight and being white and being male and having gone to Stanford and living in the San Francisco Bay Area, I mean, all of those things were huge privileges of mine that I don't know that I would have fully even acknowledged or understood as privileges at that time. But I was able to 
you know, network and leverage some of the relationships that I had and some of the confidence I'd built over the years as an athlete and other things. And, you know, it took a lot of work, but here we are, you know, almost 20 years later and I've written four books and I get to travel around the country and the world speaking to lots of people. Yeah, it's so cool. And, you know, you don't, you certainly, um, you do dig into really real issues in your keynotes because I know yeah. I've seen you speak a couple of times and funny enough, we both teach and do an exercise around the iceberg model yes. and the fact that much of what makes us who we are and what is truest about us or perhaps things we hide that we are ashamed of that we don't share. And you lead it by asking the question, if you knew me, right. if you really knew me, yeah. and then if you really, really knew me and you prompt people to share these things and they're, it's so, it's so cathartic. People, I, I know you find as I do, people just jump in. They just can't wait. I mean, they, yeah. there's this, there's this unanswered need to be seen and heard by yeah. so many people. And it trans for my work and coming from DNI, it transcends what we might have thought around race and gender. It goes to, you know, somebody with a disability in your family, addiction issues, um, socioeconomic background, or not having the right education for, you know, the role that you're in, or um, you know, just so many different family situations that occur to people that they feel they can't bring into work. And, you know, right. your, your book is well titled, you know, bringing your whole self to work. What does that really mean? And you stand up on that stage and I've seen you vulnerably share, mm -hmm. you say, I'll go first and yes. I'll share some things. <laughs> and if you yeah. really knew me, would you tell us a, a few of those things that you actually have to choose to reveal and feel vulnerable about, um, from the stage? Mm. Well, I mean, usually the way, whether I'm speaking in a you know, an event like you and I recently were at the Better Man Conference in San Francisco, and I did that exercise in a very brief sort of format in front of, you know, a couple hundred people there, or I'm sometimes in a room, you know, there could be more people, there could be less, I could be sitting around a table with 10 people on a team. What I always try to do is just tap in, in that moment, what's true for me. And it's, so it's less about my story per se, sometimes it is, but it's really about how am I feeling in that moment or what's on my mind or what's going on in my life or, you know, so it's like, if you really knew me, you would know, you know, right in this moment, it's like, I'm excited to be talking to you. And as we talk about issues of race and gender and privilege and it, you know, it, it's exciting to me and it's scary. It, it brings up, uh, you know, resistance and fear and oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing and I'm offend people. And there's, well, oh, you know, that's like what's going on in my head, like right in this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, or if you really, really knew me, you would know we just got our 12 year old daughter, a new iPhone. And I'm like excited about it and totally terrified. Cause oh I don't, gosh. there's a whole world of everything out there. And I, like, I want her to have access to certain things, but not others. And I don't know, mm -hmm what the hell I'm doing. And my wife and I are looking at each other all the time, like, where's the instruction manual? Like this is, <laughs> you know, so, uh, I mean, but it's really, and, and so what I try to do, what I've, one of the things that I've learned in for over the years and it's, is this weird concept, but I think it's so true is like the more personal, the more universal, right? The more I'm willing or you're willing or we're willing as humans to share our story and our truth and what we're feeling in some ways, people can look at me or look at you or look at others and like can't relate on the surface of all the things that might be on a resume or how we look on the surface or where we came from or race, gender, age, background, all that. But like the the humanity that we all share has to do with like a lot of that stuff that's down below the surface of the waterline. Um, and I just have always been like when I was a kid, I would sit in class like I remember just like in junior high and high school and you know, I was a good student and I did well and, but, but I had all this stuff going on in my life at home and my dad had bipolar disorder and was like, there were issues and my mom was angry and we didn't have a lot of money and like the house was a mess and I was ashamed of that. And I was trying to like, how do I, you know, I, I have a crush on that girl over there, but I don't know how to talk to her. Cause you know, I mean all that stuff. And then we're sitting in class learning about trigonometry and I'm like, <laughs> who cares? Like, why are we talking about this stuff? And I just was like, well, maybe I'm just weird. Like I have all these thoughts and feelings and everything going on inside of me. And I'm looking around and like nobody else, particularly the other boys that I was friends with, they weren't talking about that stuff. So I was like, mm -hmm. well, I must just be weird and like something's mm -hmm. wrong with me, right? Which I think, of course, everybody feels like that, right? <laughs> of course. So I've just been on this mission for most of my life. Like I want to, no, it's not about oversharing, but like I want to get real about my own experience and I want other people to be real about their experience because it just makes me feel more human, more connected, less crazy when we're t all telling the truth. 
Right. Well, of course. Gosh, doesn't that make the most sense? Um, but tell me, where where do you think men are vis-a-vis their involvement in diversity and inclusion? You know, you and I, you mentioned we were just at the Better Man Conference in yep. San Francisco, um, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Mike and I and some other, um, so many amazing leaders come and speak and hold this space for uh, I think largely the male audience, right? There are some women that come, but it was yeah. probably 80 or 90% men yeah. who are feeling all of these things. Um, right. Uncertainty, perhaps resistance, unarticulated potentially, right. or maybe, you know, it wasn't too articulated in the room. We kind of felt like there was a huge willingness in the room, I thought, yeah. to be there, be open-minded um, and a real seeking of knowledge. But yeah. um, how do we get I know with your next book, not to give away any <laughs> any <laughs> secrets, but right. you are kind of planning to dig deep more deeply into diversity and inclusion. And I'll, and yeah. you know this as well as I do, that when men and particularly white men start to position themselves as someone who has something to say on the topic, it's um it can engender some interesting responses. Yeah. <laughs> and you know you're you're stepping into this, but I know you as a person and I know you feel it's important. And I I agree that yes. we need certain audiences need to hear this from you, like yes. period, just like certain audiences need to hear it from me. We don't. It's not fair. It's not right. Um, it's not just that, right. you know, certain people can walk into certain rooms and not be questioned and not and be able to show kind of the variety of emotions that we do and not be you know, criticized for it. Um, yeah. We can, we're allowed to tell the truth um, in different ways. And so as you start to dig into this work, you and I know the the messenger is symbolic as much as the message in terms of getting that message across. And while it haunts me, it's sadly something that we, in a consulting practice like my business, we sometimes our clients say, you know, I really need a white guy to come yeah. in and deliver that session. Other times I get, uh, we really need a person of color. Yeah. Um, so, so, and I don't, I try not to judge all that. I use it as a teachable moment. We discuss it. Maybe they change their mind, but I do think that um, people listen to other people in their group and therefore, I think I'm really excited to have your voice um, emerging a bit more publicly yeah. on this topic. Well, thank you. I mean, I think there's a couple of important things that you just touched on and, and asked. I would say, um, so for me, I'll, I'll tell my journey with this and then also about, I think, how it relates to men and specifically white men, as much as I obviously can't speak for anyone else but myself. But what I see is, I think, you know, my background and my story, which a bit of which I just shared you know, issues of gender, for sure, growing up in my house, issues of race, growing up where I grew up and how I grew up and with whom I was around, um, you know, as a kid and a teen and, and a young man in particular, but have always been really important to me. Part of why I got my degree in American studies with a specialization in race and ethnicity. I graduated from high school in 1992. The spring of 92 was when the Rodney King riots happened in L.A. And at my high school, yes. Skyline High School in Oakland, like there was a huge protest and a huge walkout. And I remember the day and I was the senior class president. I was class president for all four years in high school. Whoa. I was really, yeah. And, and I was like, <laughs> <You> underachiever. <laughs> I, well, and it was part of it was, it was a whole other story. But like, I was this kid that was like, I was a popular kid. I was cool with just about everybody in the school. And most of my African-American friends and even some of the African-American kids I wasn't friends with, like one of the highest compliments you could get as a white kid was like, Hey, Mike, you're pretty cool for a white boy. <laughs> and I got that compliment and I, that meant a lot to me. And it was like, and, and part of what it was, but I remember the day I was thinking about this actually this morning, knowing you and I were going to have this conversation being on the senior lawn at Skyline High School the day after the riots and the kids and everyone were so upset and the teachers and we didn't know what to do. And the teacher just let us walk out and we, we had, but there was a group of us that gathered and I was feeling a sense of animosity from some of my African-American friends that I had never felt in my life. And some of these kids I had grown up with and there was this anger mm -hmm. and this kind of us and them and you don't know what this feels like and you don't know what's going. And it was like scary for me. I was really upset. I was upset about the verdict and what had happened and everything. But I'm like, what do you mean? Like, we're like, <laughs> and we're st and then and some of my friends were saying, listen, this is a problem that you don't understand that black people have been dealing with for generations with police and in the community. And this is a problem that we've got to figure out and we have to solve. And we're standing around. And in my, you know, 18 year old mind, as I'm listening to this and trying to have empathy and feeling scared and sad and all of it, I remember saying, 
my understanding at the time, and I think it's about true now, is that about 12% of the American population is African American. And I said, and it was really scary for me to say, I was like, if there's this boulder that needs to be pushed up the hill, and there's some of us who may not be part of that 12% who want to help push it up the hill, can we help? And the response at that moment from a number of my friends of mine was not right now. Hmm. Like, we don't want your help. And it was, you know, but, and I remember thinking of that, not totally understanding it, but so I share that. I'm not exactly sure why I'm sharing that story, but I I think there are times, I think there are times when those of us who aren't part of a particular group need to understand that the anger or the sadness or the fear or the, all the emotion involved, as much as we may want to help and participate and support, we have to step back and be able to allow that group of people, whoever that group may be, and they're not all going to, it's not a monolith, they're not all going to act and think the same way, of course, react and deal with what they need to deal with in the way they need to deal with. I think some of this is akin to what we've seen over the last year or so with the Me Too movement, that there's a way in which men need to just stand back, listen, but allow women to express themselves in the way they need to express themselves without us running into the rescue. Well, we're here to save the day, you know, because that's not necessarily, not only is that not needed or wanted, that may actually not be helping the situation. And it's super confusing and uncomfortable. And one of the definitions of privilege, I believe, is when we don't have to participate in something. So as a man, I'm privileged to not have to participate in issues of gender because like I'm the dominant gender. It's not to say that it's not aware, it's not an, it, but it just doesn't impact my life in the same way it would a woman. As a white person, I can opt out of conversations and dynamics around race for the most part unless I happen to live or work in an environment that's just by its nature incredibly diverse. A lot of white people walk around and aren't even really aware or conscious of their own whiteness because why would they be or when does it come up or how do we talk about it? So it's a long way of saying I do think for men it's really tricky because when we do step in or speak up or lean in or try to address issues, let's just say, of gender, what can happen is you can screw up, which we inevitably do, mm-hmm. and get and upset people on both sides. Upset other men like what are you doing and stop doing that and what are you saying and what are you accusing me of and who do you think I am and you're part of the problem – And then upset women for like, oh, now you're mansplaining and you're not listening and you think you know everything. And so it's like, well, okay, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm not. So we'll just say that feels really uncomfortable. I'm going to opt out of this because I can. Exactly. Because I don't know how to participate in a way that's meaningful and also not going to get me in trouble. Not just with the quote unquote boys club, although it Mm -hmm. might depending on Mm -hmm. the environment, but just in general, because it's like I don't want to cause more harm. I'm being told I already cause harm, exactly. you know, in, in just who I am, you know, yeah. and what I've inherited or what I haven't challenged in my life or, you know, the fact that I don't know the issues, you know, and, and you know, you and I can I can sit here and say, how could you not be right. like awake to all of this? But there's many I agree with you, many, many that haven't been. Right. Um, yeah. So you just articulated the the conundrum, I think, that is at the heart of inaction. Yes. Um, but the problem with inaction, of course, is <laughs> that you just said 12% of one one marginalized community and other communities are even smaller than that. Sure. Um, and even less seen, right? Yeah. Because some of us like with disabilities and LGBTQ plus people can hide yes. who we are too in plain sight. Um, and so we don't even, I know with my corporate clients, they always say, well, we need to do self-identification and and we need people to feel safe enough to check the box so that we can count you know, how many of, you know, we, we have in our workforce and how, right. you know, people with disabilities, et cetera. Meanwhile, from the communities, uh, they say, well, I don't know if I can trust the institution to check that box. You know, do, right. am I am I safe to do so? And what are they going to do with that information? And, you know, and this happens in the most progressive companies in the world. I mean, yeah. that I work with directly, yeah. that there is still that lack of trust. And so institutions really need to do better. But I mean, how how can they communicate? That this is important. You can trust us. And if you bring your full self to work and your whole self to work, that it will be honored and it won't cause more problems for you. Yes. Well, and, and absolutely. Look, and I've gotten the feedback over the last couple of years in particular, um, you know, oh, great, Mike. It's it's awesome for you to talk about bringing your whole self to work. But you're a straight white man. Like, 
it's different. You don't know what it's like to be right. fill in the blank. Right. And, you know, in my response to that, when I hear that, and sometimes it comes with a lot of anger and a lot of righteousness, and sometimes it comes with a real just like, hey, you might want to think about this or consider this or wherever it comes across that spectrum. My response, first and foremost, is like, you're right. I have no idea what it's like to be anything but me. Um, and what I do know, and you talk about this a lot and I in your work, in your book, in your presentation that you gave at the Better Man Conference, like you talk about the research around covering. And, you know, what we know from that research is that, yes, you know, certain marginalized groups cover more than others, but so do straight white men. Like there's a lot of people in the in the dominant group in an environment who are covering a lot of themselves, what they think, how they feel, who who they care about, what they're affiliated with, aspects of themselves. And so one of my approaches over the years, although I haven't been as overt about talking about race and gender and inclusion and diversity specifically for a couple of reasons, which I'm happy to talk to you about here. I've also looked at it of like if I can help people open up and be more real about who they are and their humanity and help all of us find the places where there's a lot of common ground. That's a huge deal for us being able to do that, because at the end of the day, you know, there's a ton of stuff that doesn't get addressed or dealt with or acknowledged. And it doesn't specifically have to do with race and gender and some of the different ways that we're different. It just has to do with human beings being human and being scared to actually be seen and to show up and for how they might be judged or excluded or ridiculed. That's right. Um, so that broader, the broader definitions, the acknowledgement that we all know what exclusion feels like we yes. have all overcome challenges and you know Kenji who authored the covering report I say this all the time but he always said it's not the pain olympics the goal is not right. to you know it's not a race to the bottom <laughs> in terms of the hierarchy of privilege but you know so I, I say that and we laugh and we you know we see we see what we do in that statement right we do tend to do that um but I think that that it, it it might has might have harmed our ability to progress and the way that we've looked at diversity work in general, you know, who is it about? Who right. is centered in those conversations? And yes, did we need to center marginalized voices? And do we need to do that and continue to do that? Absolutely. Right. But at the same time, you know, and you see in in the diversity networks I work in so much in corporate America, whether it's the women's group or the LGBTQ plus group, there's been a flood well, particularly in the gay groups, there's been a flood of straight allies. I mean, yeah. they now outnumber the number of people who identify as LGBTQ. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, yes, in some of my clients. And uh, they have the matching shirts and they're very proud. And, you know, they're 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 so invaluable in their, in their numbers, you know, and in the protection that that can give yeah. um, is just, you know, you can't overestimate the importance of that and the optics of it. Yeah. Um, you know, for those of us who are still closeted, but I, why don't we see more men, you know, not just outsourcing this whole gender conversation to women because men have a gender too, FYI, newsflash, um, white people have a race and ethnicity <laughs> that comes with lots yeah. of, lots of implications. And, you know, you might, if you think about it, well, I don't have a culture. I'm, I'm Scotch, Irish, UK, Anglo, whatever I am, <laughs> right, you know, right. um, but we, but we actually do, we just don't notice it because it's all around us. And it happens to be the, you know, a primary culture, yeah. I might say a dominant culture in, you know, much of the work world anyway. Right. Yep. And we get to make all the decisions. We're comfortable walking through our lives. And, you know, how, how do we how do we awaken that knowledge of when privilege gets such a bad name, but really it's just a fact of some of our lives? You know, yeah. how do you how do you talk about that with other men um, and, and create some the aha moments that we need? You know, it, it's, it's tricky because I think, again, uh, to the question you just asked and one from before too, it's, I think there's a lot of men in particular and more even specifically straight men, white men who just aren't paying attention. They're just not aware and not because they're jerks and not because they're insensitive and just because it's not in their world and on their radar screen. Do you know what I mean? I can't tell you how many, like I have a number of men in my life who are now in their fifties and sixties who have kids who are in their 
twenties and thirties. And like, you know, just as a few examples, I think of in my head who are pretty conservative, socially conservative. And then one of their kids is gay. And that had a whole journey they had to go through to make peace with that themselves. But now it's amazing to me. These men are advocating for things about, um, LGBTQ rights and things. And I got to vote for Canada. And I'm like having these conversations like, wow, it became very personal to them because their son is gay and they had a they had a personal connection now with the gay community that they didn't before. And so I say that that for a lot of men and you hear men in a way that sometimes they even get criticized for that will pay more attention to what the, the plight of women or what's going on or the Me Too movement because they have daughters. Right. right? We and totally. So, we roll our eyes a bit when we hear yeah. that. And, and and I get it, but at the same time, it's like the reason why many of us are passionate about these issues, let's be honest, it's not because we just were born with this sense of like, I know what's right and I know what's just. And I mean, maybe there's some of that, but it's because it has a personal impact in our lives, right? If you happen to be female, if you happen to be African-American, you happen to be Asian-American, if you happen to be any marginalized group, of course you're going to pay attention to this to some degree. And if you're in communities where there's lots of people that are impacted, now that's not to say that the white person or the white man who's off and hanging out with mostly other white can't pay attention. But again, understand that it's harder for him to understand and have empathy because it's not his experience. That said, for the ones that do are aware and more awake, the question then becomes is, what do I say? How do I say it? How do I engage? Because my, my own story with my own background and my own interest in this, when I first got into this work, and started to, oh, I want to speak and I want to write. What do I have to talk about? Well, I was an athlete. I could talk a bit about sports and success or team. Okay. And okay, well, I've gone through this experience. You know, what are the things like, oh my gosh, I actually know a lot and actually have education in race and ethnicity and diversity. But my thought was like, I am not going to, as a straight white man, venture into that arena because A, it feels a little scary and B, it almost seems like it would be disrespectful. There are people who are doing that work who know exactly what those experiences are like and can talk about it from experience and with credibility that my fear was that I couldn't and that I would actually be stepping on people's toes in the process. If you know what I mean? And it was like, this is kind of scary water to get into because it touches on some really emotional, very personal things. And inevitably what happens is we say the wrong thing. We do the wrong thing. My sister who in the you know mid eighties, who was four years older than me, um, who since sadly has passed away from cancer, but was a huge Im- influence on my life. But my sister was like the PC police from the time I was really young. I mean, growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, my sister was constantly like editing the words I was saying. And like, mm-hmm. even I would, you know, it's like I couldn't even call. It was like junior high school. It was like the girls basketball team. She's like the women's team. I'm like, <laughs> they're like 13, Lori. What are you talking about? And she was like, you know, really mad at me all the time. That's adorable. And it's really cute, right? And But she would constantly say, I mean, even it's like I would refer to someone as a black person. She'd say African-American. And it was like, and this is back in like 1987, right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? But she was really adamant about language and being mindful and I both appreciated it but at the same time my sister who I adored and again taught me so much in a lot of ways epitomized a very sort of intense liberal progressive mindset of like you have to say these things and think these things and believe these things and if you don't by the way you're not part of this group so what I've seen in the progressive environment in which I've grown up that there's a bunch of rules you have to follow. And if you don't follow those rules, you're in big trouble. I've had people in companies in Silicon Valley come up to me after an event and say, you know what? If you really knew me, you would know that my faith, my Christian faith is really important to me. Mm. And I never talk about it at work because it is so not okay to talk about that. And it's like, whoa. And then I could be somewhere in, you know, Louisiana or Texas, and it could be the exact opposite where someone would come up to me and say something totally different after an event. But it's essentially the same feeling and the same essence of this is true about me. This is important to me. And I don't feel safe to bring it up and talk about it because it is not the dominant and accepted perspective to have. Right. And in the South, that might be being an atheist, by the way. Exactly. Or it could be being, you know, it could be yeah, being a Buddhist or being, you know, being a a Mm -hmm. Democrat or progressive. Do you know what I mean? It's Mm -hmm. like just like being Mm -hmm. a Republican. I remember as a kid being at school one day and someone said, you know, something, something, something. My dad's a Republican. And I looked at them and I said, 
what? And he said, my dad's a Republican. And we, we were all like seven or eight. And I said, I don't know what that means, but I know it's bad. I just know it's bad. You shouldn't say that out oh loud. My gosh. Right? It's like, I had just gotten that sense at home in my house when that would come up. It was always talked about in a very negative way. Right. Right. So, I mean, that, again, and we have those things and it's the same thing. I would imagine on the reverse in certain other parts of the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, how are we our own worst enemies? Amongst progressives, um, and let's let's like talk about that a bit. Like you know, the Silicon Valley, you know that that bias of the Bay Area of, of many people covering around elements that are not welcome and not talked about. Um, you know, I I find it um, really really harmful. Um, you know, while I'm grateful that we're having conversations about what what values mean to us and our own experiences. Um, I feel as conscious um, about the left and the sort of extreme um, perhaps judgments of me as somebody who, like you described, is is on stage talking about these things. Um, what am I going to get wrong? Am I going to capture the nuances? Am I going to be inclusive of everyone that I deeply care about and love and want to represent? Um, but uh, it's just fascinating to, for me and my own learning, I just happen to be doing it relatively publicly and hoping that nobody calls me out on Twitter or, right. you know, um, sends me a direct message privately yeah. to say, you know, when you say this, it comes across as this. I just thought you should know. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for that stuff. But I'll tell you, um, you know, I, I thought maybe I would be have more more to be worried about from more conservative viewpoints, but I, I've presented to a lot of those audiences and it's my message actually is relatively unique one because it is such an inviting, inclusive yes. message, right? Like your keynote and my keynote are very similar in that way. And so folks who haven't been heard and acknowledged feel comfortable enough to share or identify as a conservative right. in my organization. And I don't, I don't really talk about that. Um, yes. And I'm I'm so I feel so proud that I've created enough space for that that admission to happen. Yeah. And I feel equally proud, though, when marginalized communities come up to me and say, thank you for naming me and yeah. calling my experience in the body you're in as Jennifer. It's so it's so much more powerful than you ever know. And those are my also my favorite moments, you yeah. know, because I, I you know, we exist in this middle of being a channel through which these two potentially or many polarized conversations can come together. And um, it's sort of an exquisite and sacred opportunity that we have yeah. in these very short keynotes that we do, yeah. you know, to do this. And so I wonder, does it feel that same for you? And I guess like how, how do we not spend this energy kind of tearing each other down on one side or the other when really, you know, we've got to, we've got to come together and get organized around this message. Uh, absolutely. Well, I think a couple things. I, I think one of my favorite Dr. King quotes is this. He said, we have no morally persuasive power with those who can feel our underlying contempt for them. Yeah, that's in your book. And I, I highlighted love that. that. I love mm -hmm. that. Right. And And that means both from one side to the other. So we're trying to influence people who we think are thinking the wrong things and coming from the wrong place. And I'm not, this is not about not standing up. This is not about not even fighting for what we think is right. But if it comes from that energy of I'm right and you're wrong, the righteousness, the contempt, mm -hmm. what it does, and, and there's some situations, some issues in the world right now where we feel like, look, think this is not okay. This is not safe. That's not acceptable. And I don't care because I'm just going to, you know, that's fine if you're clear about what the goal is. But I would say within the groups, right? And we talk about in, you know, you talk a lot about in the DNI work, intersectionality and all these different ways in which we separate and there's subgroups within groups. And, but what happens often is that within the groups, the people that were sort of, we're on the same side, we're in, we're on the same team. We're sort of standing for the same things. And then we're tearing each other down because you're not doing it the right way. You're not saying all the right words. How dare you? You don't know what mm -hmm. this is like. And look, we're yeah. human and these are really touchy and personal and emotional issues. Of course, but what ends up happening, and this is where a lot of allies start to get in, people who look like me, who start to say, hey, I'm interested, I'm interested, and all of a sudden you get slapped down a few times and you're like, ooh, that hurt, and that didn't feel good, and that could be a problem for me, and I don't want to all, all of a sudden get myself into trouble when I'm trying to help. And this, I'm not trying to play, claim some kind of, oh, woe is me, someone said something mean to me on Twitter, but like, 
it, it doesn't serve the purpose. And, you know, the, the book that I'm working on right now, the working title of it is We're All in This Together. And to me, it's like, again, without being overly naive or corny about it, like, I've always kind of looked at the world that way. It's like that comment I made at 18 years old to my friend the day after the Rodney King riots. And I'm like, if I want to help, can I help? And I don't mean that in some condescending way, but like, I'm really interested. And if you're telling me I'm not invited or I'm not included or you don't want my help, okay, I can hear that. But then I don't know exactly what to do because it feels to me like a lot of these issues, they do impact all of us. And some of us are significantly more impacted than others. But if we're going to figure them out in a way that works better for more people, those of us who do have privilege, I think being able to and being willing to wade through some of the choppy waters to figure out how we can be um, most of service, I think is a really important thing to do. You know, I've said to my, my wife, Michelle, a few times, because she gets worried sometimes. I wrote a piece, I think you and I talked about this recently, right after the election, I wrote this piece called An Open Letter to My Fellow Straight White Men. And we posted it on my blog and we posted it on the Huffington Post and linked it all the other places we syndicate. <laughs> and I was not prepared for the nasty comments oh, and yeah. all the vitriol that was going to come back at me because, you know, I write about things like teamwork and appreciation and authenticity <laughs> and these things that like if you don't like it or agree with it, you're usually not going to make some nasty comment or a death right. threat or call me a name. But I was like, oh, my God. And Michelle got really nervous. And I said, look, I, I understand this doesn't feel good. I'm a little upset about it myself. I was like, but really, w w I mean. I'm about as insulated and I feel about as safe as possible. What's anyone possibly going to do to me? And, and I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but it's like I can take it. And in fact, mm -hmm. as someone said at the Better Man conference a few weeks back that I really appreciated, like one of the best things that men can do to support women is not show up and say, hey, how can we help or what can we do? It's like call out other men that are doing stuff that we know is not cool because that's it's, it's like it's like I mean, I don't mean to be too weird about it, but it's like it's like being at a bar and some drunk guy is being obnoxious and like you stand up and like, dude, knock it off. Shut up. Get out of her. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's just a physical reaction right. to. Yeah, that's a little scary. He might punch me in the face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like I'm going to do that anyway, because even if it's not my wife or my daughter, it's like that's not OK. Right. And that's part of what we can do, among many other things, is like say, hey, knock it off. That's not cool. Yeah. And men hear other men around this stuff, too. I just. I've seen it over and over that that we we might get called the squeaky wheel or, right. you know, the broken record or angry. Um, and I say we as as women, you know, yeah. pointing these things out and you can just fill in the blank in any diverse dimension yep. when we are the ones that um, in the covering report, it's advocacy based covering, which means that. Um, after a while, you don't want to be that squeaky wheel because you perceive rightly and sadly that there is penalty that builds over time when you continue to use your voice to advocate for your community, meaning yeah. hear the joke, the comment, challenge it, um, give people feedback. You know, they everybody ends up rolling their eyes when they see you coming, you know, right. um, and you get this reputation. And it's, it's not right uh, because these things are important. These aren't these aren't just, oh, I'm going to be angry for angry sa anger's sake. It's, no. you know, if you are a leader and somebody's telling you that you or someone else is using exclusionary language or subtle microaggressions and they are taking the time to tell you why and what it sounded like and what you might do differently, I, I cannot imagine the kind of leader with a growth mindset, which you and I both talk about. I'm going to be writing about it in my second book, but Carol yeah. Dweck's work. Um when we fail to do something, why can't we simply be curious about yeah. knowing more, not asking any questions or debating, by the way, that I'm right and you're wrong or my intent was this and I didn't mean <laughs> to have that impact. Yeah. You know, that whole thing, rabbit hole, um, and just yeah. take it in because, uh, you know, I, I think we've got to let go the need. And my friend Wade Davis, who was an NFL player um, right. yeah, who was closeted and came out and is a motivational speaker now too. And he says with in his workshops with men, the very first thing he says, can we just agree to, you know, not needing to be right today, yes. like just for today, you know, and it's funny that it needs to be said right. like right at the beginning as a, as a woman, you would never say that to a room full of women, no. <laughs> like ever, 
It doesn't well, even need to be said. <laughs> it's look and, it, and I think it's humbling. I mean, one of the things I'll say for for a lot of us as men, this is true for humans. I would imagine. Obviously, I can speak to it more from a male perspective. Part of the evolution as a boy to a young man, teenage boy through you know the development of becoming a man what ends up happening is there are a lot of situations where the expectation is that we know something that we don't know mm-hmm. um you know and look this this varies i would imagine you know for me as a straight man i just think of my evolution of like you know again being interested in girls when i was growing up it's like oh and then i learned oh i'm supposed to go ask her to dance or i'm supposed to go ask her on a date or i'm supposed to know like how am i supposed to know how to do these things these are really hard and scary and vulnerable right, right. and this could be true for but so what we do is we try these things and of course inevitably we fail at them we get our feelings hurt we don't know what we're doing and then some it's not an excuse but then it's like it we start to harden ourselves up don't yeah. do that that yeah. hurts that's scary everyone laughed mm-hmm. at me i had to walk you know and then we also pretend like we know stuff that we don't know and we're socialized that way that it's like right and it's all of the data that we see that like a man will look at a job application or a, a job posting and say ah you know i got a <laughs> few of those things I'm close enough. I'll throw my hat in the ring. A woman looks at it and it's like, I have, you know, seven of the eight, but I don't have the eighth one. So I'm going to wait for four years and get three more degrees. Then I'll oh. go back and apply for job. And it's like, you know, but so, so what what's happened is we've, a lot of us as men have then acted in our lives, particularly our professional lives is this pr- fake bravado. I know how to do it. I got it. And part of what ends up happening is the righteousness or the being in charge. I mean, I see this even as mindful as I can be, even in my own home. And my wife, Michelle, and I have two girls, Samantha, who's 12, and Rosie, who's 10. And I, this is about a year ago. We're in the car and we're pulling the car out of the, and it's the car that my wife normally drives. We have two and they're in the garage and we're pulling the car out of the garage. And the way my wife had parked the car, it was like a little tough to get out. And I'm just like explaining to her, if you park it this way, it's easier and you won't, you know, and as I'm doing it, Rosie, who's nine at the time, says from the back seat, hey, daddy, stop mansplaining to mommy. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I stop at that my age? Yeah, oh. I stop my tracks and I go, first of all, I was not mansplaining. Was I mansplaining? And then I look at all three of them are looking at me like, yes, you were. And I was like, what? Oh, And I was like, and second so of all, good. Rosie, how do you know what mansplaining means? And, she's, <laughs> and she says to me, oh, Miss Leah told us, which is her teacher. And I was like, oh, wow. my God. But then I was like. But it was a really humbling moment where it's like my nine-year-old was calling me out for mansplaining. And I realized, like, <laughs> I thought I was being helpful. Mm-hmm. But in reality, as I took a step back and got curious, like, what was I saying? What was I doing? And in that little moment, we're all laughing and it wasn't a big thing. And I was, but, oh, I just unconsciously go into that mode. But it was about the car and the garage and it was with my wife. And, of course, I mean, I'm not even a car guy. I'm not, you know what I mean? It was just this... <laughs> weird unconscious arrogant thing that of course as a man explaining to a woman about here's how to but like we do that and we're not even aware of it and it takes a lot of courage for a female a nine-year-old or anyone to point it out but if we as men can point it out to each other respectfully but like Mm -hmm. yo man were you aware of that or did you notice that or right like i was with a group of executives this was about a year and a half ago for a full day and someone came into at lunchtime, I was facilitating this whole session, but someone had to come in and give a presentation. And the executive team actually had, was all men. There was one woman in the room who wasn't officially one of the executives, but reports to one of the executives, and he wasn't there, so she was sort of there in his place. And the person who came in to present was also was female. And she gave her presentation about something they were doing marketing-wise, whatever, and then people left. And after the, we were debriefing, I said, before we go back into what we we're talking about, I just want to ask you all, how do you think she felt presenting to all of you just now? Huh? <laughs> and they were like, what do you mean? I was like, what do you think when she goes home to talk to the people at home or goes back to talk to her team? What do you think she's going to say about how that went? And they weren't like really nasty. They just they weren't really paying attention to her is what was going on. Uh. And I said, do you think. She told her spouse this morning that she was going to meet with the executive team. Do you think the people on her team knew she put that deck together and came? Do you think that was a big deal for her? Mm. And then I asked, and then again, it was like, I I asked, I said, and also, look, and we're busy. Oh, yeah, we could get better. And I said, and do you think you would have treated her the same way if she were a man? Mm -hmm. And then it got really uncomfortable in the room because they were kind of looking at me like, what are you saying? And I was like, well, what do you think? (laughs) 
And then we just start to have a conversation about it. And that wasn't Mm -hmm. part of the agenda. That was not at all what I was talking to them about. But it was like, let's because I was there to talk to them about them as an executive leadership team and how can they operate more effectively together? And how can Mm -hmm. they be more aligned so they're more effective with the company? But I was like, that was a real time example. What do you think the reputation is of this executive leadership team outside of this room? And by the way, that is one specific data point because she's not going to keep it to herself what her experience was just like in here. Mm. And they were all like, whoa. Yeah. We could do better. I'm so yeah. glad you called that out. I mean, I, I just think these little tiny moments of courage, um, you know, I think every coach, every leadership consultant, I mean, we have a lot of people on um, listening to us in the world to change that do this work as independents. And you raise an interesting p- way that we can use our voice, which is as that third party, you know, we have the, we are, we are truth tellers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unlike people who are internal to organizations who have to deal with the politics and the blowback and all of right. it, we can, we can call the question. Again. And um, my wish for every leadership consultant and executive coach out there, many of whom I think don't have a great grasp on diversity and inclusion um issues and how they arise and how they are so they've always been fundamental to team performance and Mm -hmm. all of those things right but i think more and more now um every team and every leader must have some kind of muscle and some kind of self-awareness and the ability to hold a mirror up to themselves or have a consultant or a coach that does so um because inclusion and inclusiveness is becoming you know, companies are starting to and already do hold leaders accountable in a financial way yeah. for leading inclusive organizations. And they measure that through 360 feedback. They measure it through the composition of the workforce they hire and promote. Yep. Um, they measure it and they literally attach bonus money and compensation packages to it. And um, I imagine that will be more and more widespread the more the time goes on because frustratingly as you and I know in the in this business world what gets measured gets done and apparently if it doesn't get measured it doesn't get done which right. is not what I want and not what you want but no. um but it's a start um for people to realize like this is real business it yeah. matters and it costs the organization like financially for people to leave reputationally like you just said when that person goes back and shares what it was like, um, you're right that that sends ripples through so many people who are trying to gauge, am I valued here? Am I listened to? Um, am I important? Yeah. Those things those things have everything to do with whether you accept that call from a headhunter or not, or whether you're starting to look, you know, and that's why, you know, diverse talent like bleeds out of companies. And I see it that the numbers haven't changed, you know, yeah. the percentages of women and people of color at certain levels, you know, they are literally static because we have not addressed the rest of the culture around them. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes, you know, again, for those of us who find ourselves in certain positions, in dominant positions, based on, you know, our our gender, based on our race, based on our background, our education, our level in an organ, whatever it is. And, and, you know, we can be in privileged positions, whether we check all the boxes for that or not, but being willing, and and it it can feel a little scary and it can be a little risky because, for a variety of reasons, but being willing to use those positions of privilege to speak up and advocate in a way that can have people listen and have people understand. And, and I've now realized, particularly, and you mentioned this earlier in our conversation, that it wasn't as clear to me even a few years ago that I'm seeing now that I am uniquely positioned to say certain things and do certain things that other people may not be. And I'm clearly going to have my own bias and my own blind spots and my own unawareness of things and what's going on. And I'm probably going to use the wrong words and and inadvertently offend some. All of that's going to happen. And you know what? I'll live and hopefully people will give me feedback and I'll get better and I'll keep getting the feedback and I'll keep trying to stay curious so I can be as mindful as possible. But like, I don't want to let those things and my own fear and discomfort stop me from saying things and doing things that I know are important. And I can sometimes see it both in comments that people will say, and this is not some holier than thou thing, but it's like, I can see the looks in the eyes of some people like, thank God, I'm so glad you said that. (laughs) And right, because it's like people need to hear that. And one of the things way, way back when I first started doing this work that I learned was like, I was going into these companies to talk about really personal, soft, almost spiritual topics, I believed. 
And I realized, oh, how am I going to get them to take me seriously? Because people could roll their eyes. It wasn't about race. It wasn't about diversity. Right. It was just about. Right. But what yeah. I realized was like, you're oh, not what following the man code by talking no, about that stuff. But, but what I did was I was able to do you know, my background, my story. I played baseball. I went to Stanford. I got drafted by the Yankees. These are all like resume bullet points that on the one hand, in my world, I realized they don't actually mean that much inherently. Like they're interesting, but like that's a lot less of who I really am than, but they made people feel safe and comfortable and give me a certain amount of credibility. They would listen like this guy knows about winning and competition and he knows about this or that or whatever it was, or tell a story or share an example that all of a sudden what I realized was, oh, if I get people to listen and to trust me, then I can talk about things that maybe they would shut down about normally, but they're willing to give me the space to talk about them. And that's one of the things I've really worked on over the years in my own journey is to get better and better and better at doing that because that then gives me more space. And so for all of the people listening who are in those positions of influence, of who are consultants, who are leaders, who are different – continuing to work on what are the things that are important for me to do and say so that people will open up and really hear what I have to say. Because if we're simply just banging on the table, they're not always going to be open to listening to what, even though what we have to say is in fundamentally important. Right. I know. And I think um, you just described what I liken to the Trojan horse, you know, that yes. they're going to open the castle gates for certain people. And once you're in then you can, of course, unleash unleash some truth, right. um, and you know, and tell the truth. But I think that this is why all of us are needed in change because we all have different gifts, all of which are needed and necessary. Yes. And not of all of us can do this in the same way. Right. And um, if we beat our hand on the table over and over again, people don't respond well to right. that. I mean, that's just a, a fact of human nature. So, yes. you know, it really takes it takes both the anger, which has its place and is needed. Right. And it also takes the um, the careful finessing for certain audiences that I, I think perhaps, you know, you and I have a, a window into that's unique to us. And perhaps others that look like us. Um, yep. And, you know, I think that the the next wave of this work is going to be to make that point and invite people to do more. Yes. That, you know, what is the worst that can happen? I love that you said that. You know, the fear thing is is really, if you get underneath that and say, what is the worst that can happen? Because, yeah. by the way, you're still safe in your life. Like, Completely. you driving around and in your home and in your neighborhood, you know, okay, so you're called out on social media. But, right. uh, you know, I, okay, you know, right. and let me learn and adjust. And I love that you said that. So, you yeah. know, if if you're a listener and you feel like there's this, like, excuse of fear um, going on and it's leading to inaction, apathy, resistance, um, and avoidance. You know, this is Mike gave us some really great um, antidotes to that today um, in terms of the response. And when you have privilege, you are safer in your life. Like that is a fact. So Completely. use it. <laughs> yeah, Thank you so sure. Much, oh, Mike. you're this welcome. Incredible. And I know we're going to have to wait till 2020 for your next book. <laughs> well, we can talk so, about it before then. <laughs> we'll talk about it before then. And we're excited for it. But meantime, where can people find information about you and follow your work? Oh, thank you. Yeah, the best place to do that is just at, at our website, which is mike-robbins.com. Okay, great. Perfect. Well, thank you for coming and joining today. And uh, keep all the good work. And I cannot wait to hear your voice more loudly um, in my spaces. And um, I will welcome it uh, with open Thanks. arms. Thank you. Hi, this is Jennifer. Did you know that we offer a full transcript of every podcast episode on my website over at jenniferbrownspeaks.com? You can also subscribe so that you get notified every time a new episode goes live. Head over there now to read my latest thoughts on diversity, inclusion, and the future of work, and discover how we can all be champions of change by bringing our collective voices together and standing up for ourselves and each other. You've been listening to The Will to Change, uncovering true stories of diversity and inclusion with Jennifer Brown. If you've enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. To learn more about Jennifer Brown, visit jenniferbrownspeaks.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back next time with a new episode.